Girl Gang, it's Dr. Joy here and you are watching Delivering Joy MD. So this is part of our Super Mama Sunday series and we're gonna be talking about subchorionic hemorrhage subchorionic hemorrhage today. And that is a condition that affects many women in first trimester. So keep watching for more details. All right, girl gang. So subchorionic hemorrhage, let's break this down. You may hear this referred to as retroplacental clot or persistent implantation bleed. And that is because when the pregnancy gets ready to bury itself into the soft lining of the uterus, there are specific cells called the chorion that actually bury into the muscle of the uterus so that they can get access to all of the blood vessels there and begin to link the maternal blood flow and the uh, fetal blood flow. And so the chorion actually is responsible for digging into those blood supplies. And sometimes there is a little excess bleeding behind the chorion. So when we talk about subchorionic hemorrhage, we're talking about the portion of the pregnancy that is going to become the placenta. And then the rest of the pregnancy is actually going to become the baby and the amniotic sac. So just to give you a little bit of uh, idea of what's taking place, the chorion is bearing into the uterus so that it can gain a access to the blood supply so that oxygen and nourishment is taken to the developing pregnancy. Now subchorionic hemorrhage, or SCH for short, uh, occurs in about one out of four women and we will see that on ultrasound. Many of these women are gonna present with vaginal spotting or bleeding, especially old dark blood. We see a lot with subchorionic hemorrhage because right where that um, chorion is burying into the lining of the uterus, there's a little bit of leakage from those blood vessels that um, the chorion is accessing. And so we often see a little bit of vaginal bleeding. Sometimes it can be heavier uh, and it can be really scary for, for moms, especially uh, in the first trimester when moms are already worried a lot about miscarriage. If we are looking diligently for this on ultrasound, we're probably gonna see a subchorionic hemorrhage in one to three out of four women. So it can be fairly common, but definitely scary if it happens to you. So whenever you see vaginal bleeding in the first trimester, we often refer to that as a threatened miscarriage. However, with subchorionic hemorrhages, many of these women are going to go on to have normal pregnancies that are healthy with, not, with term deliveries. However, we should pay attention to subchorionic hemorrhage because they can point to problems with the placenta. So if we know that a woman has a subchorionic hemorrhage, we should follow that out until the hemorrhage goes away. In the vast majority of cases, that hemorrhage is going to be reabsorbed by the body uh, or the uh, blood will come out through the vagina as old dark blood and we'll see the hemorrhage resolve. So usually by 16 to 18 weeks, these subchorionic hemorrhages are completely gone. But we want to continue following them to make sure that the placenta appears to be developing correctly and that you're not having heavy vaginal bleeding. So what to do if subchorionic hemorrhage happens to you? The first thing I always advise women to do is to really take stock of their body. Pay attention to your bleeding. If your bleeding is becoming heavier, if it's looking more bright red versus dark brown uh, or dark red, then I think it's really important to get in with your OBGYN right away or to visit your local emergency department that has transvaginal ultrasound capability. Transvaginal ultrasound is always the best way to look at pregnancy in first trimester. So we should use a transvaginal probe to actually take a look at where that developing pregnancy is forming in the uterus and to see if there are there's any sign of bleeding behind the implantation side of the pregnancy or if there are signs that the placenta is developing over top of the cervix. And that's called placenta previa where the placenta is actually developing right over the cervix and you will see that uh, bleeding occurs in this because the placenta is one big network of blood vessels between the new baby and the mama. So that 
um, those blood vessels can sometimes be a little leaky and blood actually comes out through the cervix. So the one thing that we wanna focus on in the setting of vaginal bleeding in first trimester is making sure that the baby has a normal heart rate, that the pregnancy appears to be placed normally in the uterus, uh, and that we're watching your pregnancy hormone levels. And pregnancy hormone levels can give us some information as to whether or not the pregnancy is developing normally. Pregnancy hormone levels should double every 48 hours, and we should be able to tell weekly on transvaginal ultrasound how that pregnancy is developing. So the take-home points here are that subchorionic hemorrhage can be quite common. Watching it and making sure that it completely goes away versus getting larger is important to help us ensure that your placenta is developing normally. If you have first trimester bleeding, it's very important to make sure that you have a normal fetal heart rate, and that is best detected on transvaginal ultrasound. So how can you help yourself if you have subchorionic hemorrhage? You're going to avoid placing anything in the vagina. So no sex, no tampons, no douching. Hopefully you're not douching anyway, but if you are, stop and don't start back, please. Um, but we wanna avoid having intercourse as well because when every time that cervix is disturbed, when you place things in the vagina, a little bit more blood leaks out. So we wanna to try to have complete, what we call pelvic rest, meaning we're not placing anything in the vagina. In addition, pay close attention to your body and to your bleeding. If you start having severe abdominal cramps or heavier bleeding or passage of what looks like tissue or large blood clots, it's important that you get in with your OBGYN right away or visit your nearest emergency department that has capability for transvaginal ultrasound. Most of these are going to go away on their own without any help. There's no special diet or medication that you need to be on, but it is important that you're paying attention to your body and that you're getting adequate care. Most of us um, OBs will see a patient you know, every week or every two weeks who have subchorionic hemorrhage, especially if they have a history of uh, miscarriage in the past. I hope today's mini session on subchorionic hemorrhage has been helpful for you. Put your comments or questions below so that I can engage with you more on this topic. Subscribe here so that you don't miss a single Super Mama Sunday episode. We'll catch you next video, girl gang. Peace.